everyone. Can you hear me? No, you can't. Hi. Hi, everyone. Welcome to our panel today. Um, everyone's looking quite sharp. Hopefully, you've been having a, a productive morning and afternoon. Uh, this panel today is about disruptors. Um, in fact, it's about risk takers who are turning the classic business model upside down. They're social media entrepreneurs revolutionizing the workplace and shortening the business cycle. Corporations with incubators recreating entrepreneurial environments as a recruitment and retention strategy. Twitter consumers promoting while purchasing. They are disruptors, innovators, and entrepreneurs who keep reinventing society. And only a couple of disruptors would be wearing jeans uh, <laughs> on the panel, because they're disruptors, and, and they can. Um, they are citizens, filmmakers, gamers, and storytellers who are transforming the way we look at the world and interact with it. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce the members of the panel. We have Bon and Bo, who is the Vice President in Global Media and Consumer Engagement at Mondel Mondelez International. He's the Vice President of Global Media and Consumer Engagement there. Uh, and in this role, Bo is responsible for all forms of media, including uh, leading and developing partnerships, internal capabilities, and strategies across all forms of consumer connections, such as digital TV, print, and outdoors. Before joining, joining Mondelez, Bonin spent three and a half years at PepsiCo. Bonin has been recognized as one of business's hottest, uh, hottest rising stars in lists that include Fortune 2011, 40 Under 40, Fast Company's 2011 100 Most Creative People in Business, Ebony's Power 100, and Interna Internationalist 2012 Internationalist of the Year. Am I making you blush yet? I, I, <laughs> sounds like I didn't do anything in 2015, though. <laughs> exactly. He's co-author of the 2010 book, Perspectives on Social Media Marketing. Uh, bon and Bo. Thank you, guys. Bon and Bo. Sorry about yeah, that. It's okay. uh, we have Gotham Chopra, who is next to me an old friend of mine. He is the co-founder of Graphic India as well as a filmmaker, journalist, author, and entrepreneur. As a journalist, he's reported from dozens of countries and interviewed a range of leaders from former Pre President Clinton to the Dalai Lama. He's author of five books, most recently The S Seven Spiritual Laws of Superheroes, and his latest film, Decoding Deepak, which I encourage you to see because it's fantastic. It's about his father Deepak Chopra and his relationship to him, which has earned multiple awards and is available in over a dozen countries. Gotham is co-founder of Liquid Comics and Graphic India, through which he has collaborated with creators like John Wu and Guy Ritchie, also Michael Jackson. Uh, he is now working with Participant Television on a scripted series called Headliners, and his latest collaboration with ESPN and the award-winning 30 for 30 film series combines two of his greatest loves, sports in India, and we're lucky to have Gotham because I know he's pretty recently just gotten off a, a plane from a three-week trip from India. Next to me is Ryan Holmes, who is the CEO of Hootsuite, which I use religiously. He's a thought leader, dog lover, and serial entrepreneur. Holmes has redefined the face of social media by bringing Twitter, Facebook, and other social networks out of the dorm room and into the boardroom. Holmes has grown Hootsuite from a lean startup to a global leader in social media, including 79 of Fortune 100 companies. A college dropout, he started a paintball company and pizza restaurant before founding Invoke Media, the company that developed Hootsuite in 2009. I hope you're fine with me saying that, because <laughs> yeah. I just did. Uh, an angel investor <laughs> and advisor, he mentors startups in Canada and around the world through Hootsuite University. Holmes partners with major universities to deliver social media coursework to the next generation of business leaders. Hi, Ryan. Hi there. And we also have Kenneth Lair who is an American businessman and media executive. He was the chairman and co-founder of that little known uh, social media enterprise, the Huffington Post. He is managing director of Lair Ventures. Founded in January 2010, Lair Ventures is a seed stage venture capital fund. Investments <coughs> include Warby Parker, Rap Genius, Sale Through, Group Me, MakerBot, and Birchbox, and the fund makes about 40 investments a year. In addition, Lair Ventures runs its own incubator, Soho Tech Labs. He's the chairman of Betaworks and BuzzFeed and the chairman of Bedrock. He's a past executive vice president of AOL Time Warner and was founding partner of New York-based corporate communications advocate for the continuation of the assault weapons ban as federal law. Welcome, Welcome. Kenneth. Okay, deep breath. Those were long bios. Um, Bonin, this, this session today is about disruptors and, and social innovators and turning the traditional business model upside down. And, and you were the one who helped to conceive of this panel. So how would you define what a disruptor is and, and how would you say you are one of them? Wow, 
Well, uh, first, hello, Milken. How are you guys? <laughs> I guess that's a little disruption there. Um, uh, yeah, you know, it's interesting because when we started talking with Milken, they said, well, what would be interesting? Um, we said, well, we shouldn't do the traditional social media that, you know, uh, let's talk to folks that believe that the status quo is something that needs to be changed. And so I, I think that I feel very honored to be on the panel because I think you are a huge disruptor in terms of transforming journalism. And also I think, you know, what Ken did at the Huffington Post, it's interesting, there's a chart, I remember I used to show it, and it showed the readership, online viewership of New York Times up, 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 and then it would show Huffington Post. And then all of a sudden there was this inflection point where the Huffington Post broke through New York Times and Times actually started going down. And you're just like, wow, in a in five year period, what you were able to do, and it's because you believe that journalism, and I don't want to speak, put words in your mouth, but one of the innovations was maybe we should change headlines in real time. Maybe SEO should be something that actually matters because it's the guts inside of uh, the internet and the web and the ability to capitalize and create an organization around ethos is that are totally different than what the status quo is. I think that represents a disruptor to me. So somebody who says, okay, I believe there's something that can be better and I'm going to be relentless about getting to a better state and also help change industry culture uh, and innovation in the process. I hope that was a good definition. So, no, but that, it's interesting because you said the status quo needs to change. Can it change? Um, I believe New York Times was status quo and now the New York Times wants to look more like Huffington Post. So I do think it can change. I do think it requires, um, I, Big organizations are a great example. They're big tankers, uh, so it requires um, a lot of dedication, focus, and it requires somebody who is also going to bring, I think, in big organizations, people along and inspire them that there's a bigger vision of something that we can do that's greater uh, than the way we're operating now. So I guess the answer is yes. I think I've been a part of changing status quo in organizations, so. Definitely. Well, well Ken, on that note, it's true what Bonin said, that HuffPo has really transformed and. and in many ways revolutionize the way we consume news on the web. So I ask you, can a lot of these more traditional companies and, and brands retrofit themselves and, and become relevant in the way that Huffington Post has, has, has uh, kind of emerged in this space? They can, but it's incredibly difficult to do. I think for a number of reasons. First, you have a financial legacy that's very difficult to get out from under. So. The New York Times is a good example. They have a traditional business, and they can't just leave the traditional business and go into the new web business, and it's a balancing act. And you have that huge financial legacy that drags them down. I happen to think they're doing a great job of, a much better job now than they were three years ago. Um, so I think it's difficult because of the financial legacy. I think it's difficult because the people inside the traditional companies are getting paid to continue the traditional company, right? So big organizations don't necessarily reward out of the box thinking. Now, obviously some do and people change that, but generally they don't. So you find more big companies buying startups rather than um, incubating them. And I think that's the way it's always going to be. And so what kinds of things do traditional companies like the New York Times and others need to do to stay relevant? Well, I was having a conversation with a friend who runs a big magazine about uh, five years ago and he said, what do we do? And I said, well, I think what you should do is you should hire a completely new staff to put your traditional magazine out of business because you're not going to do both. And he didn't, and um, they're not doing spectacularly well right now. But I, I think you have to incubate new companies within a brand and say, go, go, go put us out of business. Go see what you can do. Um, that's what I would do. And Ryan, this is something that, that you do. You, you consider yourself to be an incubator. Um, what does that exactly mean, and how do you go about doing it? So, you know, I, I think a few year, years ago, um, one of my investors uh, asked me to come and speak at his company, which has a whole bunch of MBAs uh, and, and really smart people there, but talk about entrepreneurship. 
And I was kind of like, well, why do you, why do you need that? And to me, that was a kind of uh, aha moment that he said they were, they were kind of floundering. They were thinking about what to do next, where they should be going. And they, they didn't have an entrepreneurial kind of esprit de corps and, and a culture there. And so as I thought about my company getting bigger, you know, we're 300 people now, we're four years old, so we've rocketed really quickly. I see that we, we become more process intensive, create more systems, and, um, and, and kind of get to the point where um, everybody's guarding you know, our, our core business. And that's a, a good thing. They're, they're optimizing and refining that all the time. But what I've looked at doing, and I think I've done this pretty early in terms of the life cycle of our company, is I've created a team uh, under my corporate development uh, leader uh, that is looking at, at uh, acquisition and looking at um, side projects that are unrelated to our core. Um, and they're just doing ideation all the time, so it's an entrepreneurial role, um, which has kind of been batted around a little bit in the last little while. And so I, I think I want to start that really early in our, our company. I want that to, to be something that, that continues with the companies at our, our core all the way through. It's one of our companies, we've got seven core values. Entrepreneurship is one of those core values, and I want to make sure that we retain that throughout our our uh, whole life cycle. And, and Bon, an incubation is something that, that you all at Mondelez do, and, and you have some major blue chip companies uh, uh, assigned to your roster. Um, how important is incubating for you and, and for these traditional companies? Uh, so I'll give you an example. So last week I was in London, and I happened to go to a house party for London School of Economics. I realized two things. One, I was clearly way too old to party like they party, um, and it was way too late for me. I actually left early. So anyway, whatever. Um, but one of the things is there were two types of, and so I did this like undercover boss. I didn't tell anybody who I work for, just had conversations. What are the type of organizations that you're excited to work for? Either it was the McKinsey's, the Bain, the BCG's of the world, or it was Google, so on and so forth. And more the tech, the folks that you, or there was maybe go and start a startup. So when I started talking to those folks that were kind of more in this, I may, maybe you could say entrepreneurial kind of uh, approach, um, it was clear that they didn't look at consumer packaged goods companies as any place that they would ever want to go. They see us as sleepy organizations, they see us as boring. One of the biggest challenges we have is there was a great Bain uh, report that said by the year 2020, every single package that we sell will be connected to the internet. So if you think about that, that means we might be the largest technology company in the world. And as I look around the organization, we don't look like Google, we don't look like Cisco, we can't attract the talent like that. So how do we recreate, or how do we create a culture that actually shares with the outside world that we are, there is an opportunity to actually be entrepreneurial inside of the organization. So what we decided to do was launch a platform called Mobile Futures, which is a mobile accelerator, and it's about identifying startups to connect to our brand. So uh, we do an open call for startups, and then we bring those startups in, and we have our brand leaders uh, launch pilots with them in 90 days, operate at the pace of a startup, so do it really fast in 90 days. Um, at the same time, our people had to go and spend up to two weeks working for the startup. So they had to leave their, their day job behind and actually go work for the startup so they could experience kind of the culture. And so we we're going after this cultural transformation. And what we've been calling it inside the organization is entrepreneurialism. So internal entrepreneurs. And we're celebrating them. We're bringing them up you know, to senior leadership. We're highlighting the pilots that they're launching, win or fail. Um, and I think that the challenge that, and Ken brought it up, I actually think not just is their legacy business, but there's emotional legacy. So we pay lip service, like we want different thinkers, but when they actually think different and they fail, we punish them. So how do you change that culture inside of, you know, in big organization? I think it takes structured programs that are really focused on highlighting, you know, the spirit that you, you really want. And pay them for thinking like that. So the thing I tried to do, so there's two phases actually. So that was phase one, phase two, was we are actually going away to Stanford Mobile Lab for a week, and we're actually challenging ourselves to come up with our own startups. And we're gonna choose to incubate them within 90 days and then pitch them to VCs. What I tried to do was try to get us to give them actual shares in that company. Because I, I agree, I think the biggest challenge we have for getting that talent, or one of the other challenges, is compensation. The compensation model that's there today is it's meaningless. It right. really is meaningless, given what the opportunities are for that talent outside. Unfortunately, I couldn't get it through, but my goal is to do that in year two, is to how do we act that way and give them real stake and upside. There's no upside. Right. Sorry. In Gotham, in many ways, 
your, comp uh, your companies, some of your companies are, are based in India. So you're doing this, you're incubating, but you're doing it uh, overseas in India. How does that work? I mean, <coughs> India, just having spent three and a half weeks there, like literally as of 48 hours ago, is such a chaotic place with no rules. And, and that's part of what makes it exciting. There's plenty of room for innovation. Um, there's very few organizing principles. Um, but I think, you know, strong vision, aligning with the cultural culture, aligning with the cultural values, having strong leadership. I've been fortunate, you know, both iterations of the company that, you know, I, I have in India. I founded it with Sir Richard Branson and our latest sort of partner is Peter Chernin, both of whom are like the patron saint of entrepreneurs, you know, patron saints of entrepreneurs, and have really given us the resources, but also the runway and the patience to make mistakes. And I work, I mean, the company I have, Graphic India, is with artists and writers, and so much of what we have to go through with them is an unlearning process. I mean, this is a culture where, at least in this sector, has really been um, committed to outsourcing. So, you know, all the movies you see from DreamWorks have really, you know, they, you think they're being produced in Burbank, but they're really being produced in Bangalore. And, you know, so much of what we were trying to do was to sort of undo that culture of being in the, you know, the, the back office to a, you know, innovation, storytelling. And, um, you know, how do you train a guy, and it's mostly guys, sadly, still right now, but how do you train a guy to say it's it's okay to make mistakes. It's you know we want not every character to come out looking like a different version of Shrek. We want you know what's India's Pokemon? Yet you know where we have this incredible vault of mythology uh, that goes back 5,000 years. We always say you know we have the original superhero universe and our you know crazy Hindu gods. How do we mine that and really give artists an opportunity to tell their stories to the world and. Um, so we've, you know, we've struggled. We've made our own mistakes. That's why we're on to Peter Chernin um, <laughs> and, and working with him. But I think, you know, that sort of environment um, has really been exciting and invigorating for entrepreneurs. And just out of curiosity, what would, what would be in it for the likes of Peter Chernin and, and Sir Richard Branson? Are they looking at uh, capitalizing on the Indian market, yeah, or are they I mean, trying look, to recruit talent? No, the macro numbers, I mean, are... It's the largest youth market in the world, right? It's uh, 550 me million people under the age of 20. And there are no indigenous Supermans and Spidermans and Batmans. There are no Pokemons. I mean, Pokemon is a $30 billion property today. Um, and it started on a napkin in Japan. And, um, you know, so I think the market there is this sort of wildly expanding hungry marketplace and whereas you know I, I mean I've spent my whole life going back and forth you know I used to go there and everybody was dying to sort of come here and live here go to school here now everybody's dying to go back there and there's just so much opportunity and there's you know there's a lot of capital obviously flowing as well so I think you know if you wanted to start Marvel Comics today, I mean, this was sort of the principle for founding the company, you would start it in a marketplace like Asia and you would do it digitally. So. It is so true. Indian mythology is so incredibly rich. Um, can you, speaking of incubation, you started Soho Tech Labs to do exactly that. What, what, what does Soho Tech Labs actually do? Well, the reason we started Soho Tech Labs is because we wanted to own some of the companies we invested in, a bigger percentage than a seed round would let us own. So it really is to balance the portfolio. In it, we, have a, we have three seed funds in our second and third funds. We also have money for follow-ups in the companies we invest in. But at the end of the day, we might own three or four or five percent of some of those companies. So we decided maybe we'll have our own ideas that might work, where we can own 100% at the beginning and then take outside money. So uh, we started a company called Now This News, and we started a company called Rebel Mouse, um, and a few others. So mostly it's just to make us feel as smart as the entrepreneurs we invest in and try to come up with our own <laughs> ideas. We kid ourselves. Yeah. <laughs> Clever. Uh, or Ryan. I like Rebel Mouse. It's Rebel Mouse is great. Rebel yeah. Mouse yeah. is good, right? Yeah. yeah. 
Um, Ryan, you started at Hootsuite University. Um, so much of this really is about kind of turning models upside down and, and almost allowing people to kind of relearn new processes. And that's part of what Hootsuite University is about. So, so what are you mentoring young people or what are you trying to convey to the next generation of, of entrepreneurs? Well, so, so the, the university product's a little bit different than the mentoring I do on startups. The, the, uh, so Hootsuite University is about uh, helping people understand social media and how that works within an organization. So how to use our tool, but also how to use social media as a whole. Um, it's, it's really just focused on, on that and, and how this new communications me mechanism has, has radically changed communications and, and organizational structure. And, and that's really the certification. Everything that goes along with that is kind of coupled with that. I do mentoring on the side, and, th and that's more around finding, identifying entrepreneurs that are doing really cool, amazing stuff and helping them um, you know, in a way that uh, I wish I had a hand uh, back in the day. So what kinds of things are, are you looking for uh, in, in pursuing additional investments? And I'll, and I'll ask all of you that question. Uh, I guess in terms of things that I think are interesting right now, social, uh, you know, I'm looking at things with the social bent. Uh, I like uh, disruption of enterprise software, so SaaS, uh, freemium, cloud-based, all kind of uh, hashtags of things that I look for. So what does that mean when you look for hashtags? Oh, oh sorry, <laughs> hashtags of, of, those would be the keywords that I would be looking for. Uh, SaaS, freemium, um, uh, cloud-based, these are all things that I think are really interesting and disruptive right now um, and that I have good kind of uh, pattern recognition and experience in. Okay. And Ken, what, what kinds of things are you looking for in, in investments that you are pursuing? Well, because it's seed, uh, whatever we invest in on day one probably isn't the same thing a year later. So you really invest in the person, I think, and the idea. But well, I would only invest in a company where I liked the human being who was presenting the idea, first of all, because you want to be a partner. And you don't want to be a partner with somebody you don't want to spend time with. So you look for the person, I think. And obviously, the idea needs to be one that you think will grow and become a big enough company. There are certain trends that are happening in the industry that are obvious. I like to invest in what I think is obvious. So we try to lean into those trends. Um, and you. So, and but when you say when you look, you, what you look for today may be different than what you looked for a year ago, does that mean no. you're looking at exit strategy as well? Is that, is, that a, is that a major well, component no. of what you look for? I mean, obviously all our investments we want to have an exit for. So if you think it's a little tiny idea, you're, you're probably not going to invest in it, right? So you want it to be big enough where you think uh, it can have a successful exit. But, no, I mean, when I started the Huffington Post, there was no such thing as social. The word didn't exist. Mm -hmm crazy to think about that, right? That was, what, eight years ago. Yeah. So look how fast things have changed. So you need a group of people around the table, and I hope we have the right ones, who are very much in touch with deal flow and what's happening in New York City and following the trends and trying to get ahead of the trends. So the obvious ones are mobile, right? Um, social. Um, I might be the only person in the world who still wants to invest in content, but I love content. Um, and we're not afraid of e-commerce, and a lot of people are um, don't like e-commerce. So, um, but there, but there isn't any category we won't invest in. But I think we like to try to understand the macro tre trends and then lean in. Bonin, how about you? What kinds of things do you look for in? investments. Yeah, of course. Um, so just to, just to give the audience some context, so Mondelez International, um, we used, we spun off Kraft Food Group. So before that we were Kraft Foods. In October 1st we spun off Kraft Foods Group, the grocery business, and now we're the world's largest snacking business. So we own brands like Oreo, Cadbury, Dairy Milk, Trident, uh, the whole Nabisco portfolio, so on and so forth, just so you guys have some context. So, and, and my job is to run 
media globally. And so we spend well over a billion dollars in media uh, around the globe. Um, at the same time, because of the transformation that's happening, whether it's mobile, you name, social, all these things, what we used to core invest in is becoming less and less important. So television. And the reason why it's becoming less important, it's funny because content is actually, content consumption is on the rise. But the problem is, is that people are less engaged. So the moment a commercial comes on TV now, because of this device, you automatically, it triggers, like it's text time, it's time for you to send emails. So, you know, so we see the return on investment, or the, the point of diminishing return reducing year over year as a result of low, low engagement rates. The other thing is that this device is now at the core places that you used to purchase me. So you used to come and buy us at convenience. So you would stand in the convenience board and you would look and you would see gum and you would see candy and you would buy it now your head's down in this device the entire time so 50 years of display uh, uh, you know um, uh, capability building on how to build displays to get you is now being thwarted by a lot of this or you now have this in aisle so you used to walk the aisles and browse now you're walking the aisle looking at your shopping list so we have there are big challenges that the the pace of changes is is um, is taking on our business at the same time, those are big opportunities. So because I now have a captive audience, one of the things we see during prime time is that if we run digital and TV at the same time, we actually see twice the effectiveness of our television. So if you look, on average, most CPG companies spend 90% of their money on TV. If I could make 90% of my investment work twice as hard, that's a huge opportunity. But it requires us to lean in on things like mobile. So mobile's big. If I can capture you and you're a captive audience in store, the other thing we see is you know, huge growth. If I can deliver, so let me step back. We know that mobile commerce shopping in developed markets is coming. So it basically means you scan and bag. You scan a product, you put it in your thing, you, walk, you bag it yourself, you walk out, you pay with your mobile phone. We know that's coming because what it allows is those retailers to take people off the floor and put them into other, deploy them into other places or value in the business. So we know that that's coming in a big way. Walmart has announced it, Tesco, all these, you know. So we started running tests, and when you scan, you scan a pack of cheese, I can deliver a coupon that says, hey, you might want to buy Ritz. The redemption numbers are through the roof. We've never seen stuff like this. Now, it just requires us to lean in on that. So for us, the, the, where we see the opportunities are, and these are relatively new concepts. So if you look at what we did with Mobile Futures, that was about finding companies in three very distinct areas, social TV, mobile at retail, um, and location-based. So you're near a store, I can tell you to go in and buy my product, or you're driving using a thing like Waze, but those are also two-year-old companies. So they don't have scale. They don't have the kind of scale that most marketers look for. So what we've done, so those are the three areas that we like. What we've done, and I'm sure they're gonna grow, but what we've done is we've really repositioned our mindset and said, okay, if you think about it, Facebook has a billion users. We sell well over a billion products a month. If we just used our footprint to put a new technology on the, every single pack or in advertising or in point of sale. So at the end of the day, it's not about, for us, it's not about the technologies that have scale, it's about those that have transformational opportunities and for us to use our scale to make them big. So, so those, three, those are the three areas, but also those that we see are transformational enough to make big. Rebel Mouse is a great example. On average, I'm guessing a brand website is probably between 200 dollars and $300,000 with Rebel Mouse, you don't need brand websites anymore. You can basically have a brand website that runs on your feed. It's, we're, we're launching it actually on a number of our products. It's transformational. So those are the you know kind of things. So are you saying that these brands uh, are, are investing in the technologies now? So we're not investing in the technologies necessarily because it's tough. We, if you wrote us a check, we wouldn't really know where to put it. So you know the other thing is is most most of these companies don't have. You know, you don't see return for five years, and most of the folks on these businesses are not going to be around, and, or not going to be on that same business in five years. So it's not about investing. What it is is it's about um, moving ad dollars, moving marketing dollars to run programs with those early stage technologies. I have a long list of companies to give you after this. Done. <laughs> <laughs> Done. But Bob, uh, give me an example of of how you now, because you 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 hold up your phone and you say this is where it's at. It's at mobile. So give me an example of how you use mobile. In, in your marketing strategy. Of course. So I think the first thing is is that when we look at the growth of our business, clearly it's brick, but it's also, you know, Africa. It's also the places where it's not about mobile first, it's about mobile only. Like this is the only device that you will interact with most likely um, throughout your day. In fact, I think it's 25% of content is consumed on a mobile device, but less than 1% of advertising dollars actually go to it. So I see that as a big differential opportunity for Was us. Was that a worldwide number? That's a worldwide number. And I think that's a big opportunity. That's a gap. I 
want to get in early so I can lock, if you look historically, big CPGs like Unilever, Kraft, you know, they invested really early in television and they have low basis points and that's why it's, they do so much better in terms of return on investment than some of the newer companies that come in. So these opportunities are open for us. So we're moving aggressively. We actually committed 10% of all of our media spending into mobile, not of digital, but of overall media. So that's kind of the flag in the ground of where we're trying to go. To give you an example of what the types of things that we're looking at, again, location-based. So why don't I know that before I used to run a TV ad right before you would leave in the morning on your commute and then we would see for gum let's say and we would see impact at convenience immediately because you were reminded top of mind awareness okay great the problem is your morning routine doesn't even have for a lot of folks that that main uh, you know content channel in it anymore you wake up this is the thing that's next to you this is your alarm clock you check it so we're looking at we know you're gonna check the weather on this. We know you're gonna spend your entire commute with this. So how do I advertise in those things that are gonna be endemic to the behaviors that, are gonna, that you're going to take when you're close to point of purchase? So weather or um, news, all those kind of things. And how do I do it at the time when I know you're commuting? So morning, so on and so forth. Or how do I work with technologies that provide um, couponing, digital couponing uh, inside store at point of sale, close to point of buying? So those are kind of generally the kind of stuff. So what does TV, as someone who works in TV, <laughs> what does TV need to do to stay, to stay relevant? Um, go ahead. No, 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 no. People, yeah, yeah. Well, people, people, are obviously, <laughs> people are obviously watching television, yeah. but how, how is TV going to, to stay relevant? In, in so TV is being disrupted today like print was nine years ago, right? But yet people are still watching. Well, no, and of course they're going to still keep watching, but college kids today... The first thing they do, they don't say, sign me up to cable. They watch it all on their laptop. And now, with our successful content companies, 50% of all content is now consumed on your mobile phone. And in our successful commerce companies, over 50% too. So TV's got to figure it out, or they're going to go the way of print. Now, print's not disappearing, but the, but the companies are changing a lot. So. I don't believe that many young people uh, know what ABC, NBC, and CBS news is today. <laughs> they don't watch it. Um, so the video business, cable and broadcast, is now at the very beginning of being significantly disrupted. And they better figure it out or they're going to have to buy all the companies that are being started today for a lot of money, which they will, right? I mean, who's going to buy all these content companies? The pendulum has totally swung from distribution to content. So what is, um, what is MSN, Hulu, Netflix, yeah. Yahoo, yeah. AOL, all have in common? They all need content. So it's a wonderful time to start a video content business because they're all going to be major buyers. So TV's got to get with it. I think uh, Twitter's done some really interesting stuff recently with uh, Nielsen ratings as well. And, you know, as Bonin's mentioning, as soon as the ads come on, people are on social. They're commenting. They're talking about the show they're watching. Um, and the data that Twitter is getting behind the scenes there is incredible. And, and as that ties into the Nielsen data, that looks really interesting. So are you saying that, that, that people are, are monitoring Twitter uh, as a way to get a sense of how programming is faring? Yeah, absolutely. So what, what, you know, what is the engagement in the content uh, and how does that relate to um, the overall show and audience, et cetera? It's, it's a lot of data that they can get. Because from. more people probably, you know, more people certainly are in mobile devices than have Nielsen boxes. It's probably, it could be a more accurate representation I would, of viewership. I would say it. And the relevance of it. I mean, you know, 18, I don't want to talk out of school and stuff, but 18 to 34 year olds, we know that they have this device and we know specifically versus having 18 to 34 year olds who live in households. I don't know even what that really means. Does that mean they watch? You know, I think it's interesting because I actually think print's the new digital 
I watch the print guys go through the worst time of their lives, but come out on the other side more innovative than almost any other media company. So if you think about what the print guys did, they had this print product, and then nobody started, at, there was no advertising for it, so they had to create digital products, they had to create video products, they had to create social products, and now they have this storytelling capability that is multi-channel. So they can tell a story that starts in print, that goes to social, that moves to video, or so on and so forth. So I think it's really interesting when you're forced with that type of pressure to change what comes out in this multi-channel. And I think that multi-channel is the new name of the game. So we launched a thing with Twitter and Fuse um, and our Trident brand. And it was, we just launched it last week, how do you reinvent television? So right now, you, the way it works is TV comes on and then people talk about that television show on Twitter, right? So we said, well, why can't we start from what people are talking about, create a TV show, and then put that back into the ecosystem, and then also create content throughout the day um, along those lines. So what we do is we have a, it's a called Trending Now, sorry, Trending 10, and it um, is a half hour show that's made in the morning and a half hour show that's made in the night. And then there's 25 pieces of content that are shared across multi-screen with Twitter as the distribution platform, but Fuse as kind of the content creation platform. So we reinvented the Fuse Studio, we're reinventing distribution because we know that uh, you know, Fuse is maybe big at 6.30 at night and maybe potentially big in the morning, but throughout the whole day, people want to, you know, consume that content, but they're not being created bite size or fast enough. So I think that there's going to be this, to what Ken said, is content is super important. There's going to be a reinvention of the power of distribution or a reinvention of how that content uh, is created in real time. If you look at what we did with Oreo and the Super Bowl. But wait, back to the Sorry. Trident. So does that mean more people are consuming Trident and chewing chewing Trident gum as a result of this, so, <laughs> this shift? There you go. We got one. <laughs> we got one right here. So uh, yes. So so, that, that, yeah. so yes, and that's the goal, which is 18 to 34 year olds are big gum buyers, and so we know that they're consuming content throughout the day on this device, but we don't have, and we also know that music is the number one talked about thing on Twitter. So how do we capture the power of those two things and deliver on the devices that we can actually reach them on? You know. So it, it's interesting because I actually, I, I firmly believe that. Uh, television is one of the mo most enjoyable experiences, but I think we talk about traditional TV, it's not about that, that is just another screen. It just happens to be a bigger one that's in the house. But what traditional TV is, is this business model that's based on advertising. The problem is, is you have folks like Dish who are launching the Hopper, where you don't even you don't even have to fast forward by the commercial; it automatically skips the commercial for you. And then you know, and and we have a DVR behavior. I mean, it's real. Everybody watches Modern Family; they tape it or they wait for the 15 minutes so that they can sit down and then fast forward through the ads. I mean, that is real. So that business model that it's based on, which is we're going to interrupt your viewing experience with these 30 second spots, that's what needs to change. We're still willing to pay for the opportunity to capture those eyeballs somehow, but we just need to reinvent what the product is. Well, why would anybody watch anything because it's on rather than when you wanted to watch it? So are we going to see, I mean, are, are, are the 30 second spots just going to disappear at some point? Well, I don't know, ask him. Do you, I mean, do you, do you see that, that, that trend in television happening soon? I, I, I think um, we have to use the medium different. We have to create episodic viewing. In our, in our spots, we have to create must-see kind of content. I think the days of being able to slap a product with a pretty shot and a tagline for 30 seconds, I think those days are gone. Um, and I think it, it, it requires us to understand deeper storytelling and be better content creators and to work with folks you know, like Gotham um, on how do we create richer kind of stories. I think, I, you know, I, we're, we're looking at a number of, the, the other thing I would say is that the co-viewing experience too. So we're also looking at how do you create a co-viewing experience. I'll give an example. Coca-Cola had an uh, ad in Hong Kong. And the ad, uh, there was this um, kind of youth movement called Chalk, which meant fast moving action, fast moving action. So they created an app that tied to this commercial called Chalk, 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 Chalk. And basically they have these caps in this ad that Coca-Cola caps that pop off. And they ran the ad at 10 o'clock at the exact same time every single day. And if you waved your phone in front of the ad, you could capture bottle caps and redeem points. Best advertisement in the last 30 years in Hong Kong because they created a must view experience and then they tied it you know, to a device that's relevant and gave you an overall kind of uh, experience. So I think we're going to see a lot more of that type of innovation because at the end of the day, why shouldn't we show something at 10 o'clock all the time? Why shouldn't we use it in the same exact way that content But you're creates? incentivizing. And, and incentivizing. Yeah. Yeah. So. Well, Gotham is someone who creates content, has, has 
what you do changed given the different demands in, in, in marketing and, and... Yeah. Well, first really of all, I mean, I have to say, like, I'm pretty myopic in my behavior patterns, right? It's amazing sitting, because I'm not an, if you want analytical stuff, I mean, you have come to the right place in terms of looking at trends and seeing how things are changing. I feel to some extent, you know, I was just thinking to myself, and I was seeing one of my high school classmates here um, in, in the audience. We have our 20th reunion in a couple weeks, and I'm going to make him go. Um, but, you know, when I, and I hate to be so cliched and turn this into some sort of spiritual thing, but it's kind of my <laughs> obligation now. You are, um, you, you, know, you are a Chopra. My, my dad, actually, when I was in high school, he never sort of really cared what kind of grades, which was like the antithesis of an Asian parent, as you know. Yes. Um, <clears throat> he never, he sort of said, doesn't matter. And I happily complied. I failed out of Mr. Bachmeister's um, biology class and <laughs> barely made, th made it through math. But the four things he told us all was, was um, you know, ask yourself these questions. You know, who am I? Why are you here? Why are you here? Does your life have meaning and significance? And how can you be of service? And literally, like I think from the age of probably like fourth grade on, every day those were were our mantras, you know, pun intended or usage of the um, word. So as a creator, I still ask myself those questions. And yes, I sort of try to listen and observe trends and understand what's going on. But I still sort of think, you know, the amazing creative laboratory of imagination is here. And, you know, I, I listen to what's going on in the world. You know, the company I created, Graphic India, um, was originally Virgin Comics, was out of an experience, you know, you and I have both had, which is traveling through Afghanistan and meeting young kids and realizing that they didn't have heroes, you know. And in a culture that is bankrupt of heroes, Osama bin Laden's rise, you know, Lisa's heard the story a million times and then has lived the story. I was in, um, in, um, the Northwest Frontier part of Pakistan three weeks before September 11th, talking to 12-year-old kids about their lack of heroes. And you know what happens in a culture like that? These sort of exaggerated gangsters like Osama bin Laden rise and sort of are wildly charismatic and have an ability to sort of harness that anger and frustration. So my company, Graphic India, sort of was born out of that. I want to give these kids in South Asia a platform to create heroes, you know, to create their supermans. And, and you know, I was listening to what you were saying, Ken, is like, it's about people. And it's about, you know, giving opportunities to people to sort of build and dream and, and imagine. And I think that's still, for me, you know, what I try to do, which is sort of, you know, where does the, you know, it's the thing my father and I sort of argue all day long about, which is, you know, he's this amazing sort of spiritual mind, but I'm always frustrated because I've spent so much time in these, you know, horrible places, to, to be honest, like where does the rubber hit the road? And I think the rubber hits the road, we're sort of at this exciting time now, because we all have these tools, we have these technologies that enable us to create, and so you no longer have to go work for, you know, ABC or CBS to tell your story to the world. You can now do it. We're seeing it across social media. We're seeing it ignite revolutions in the Arab Spring. And so I, I think it's an incredibly exciting time to be a creator. Um, and, and if the storytelling is, is powerful and strong enough, people will find it. Yeah. It just helps to have a great marketing strategy. <laughs> well, but I think you know, brands are increasingly realizing that that's, you know, so is the 30 second ad going away? Yes, as we know it, but you know, a new iteration is coming of it, coming. And, and it's about marrying with creators. And I think it's, you know, it's this notion of real time. So you have to operate, you know, so I'll give an example. So for Oreo and, and Super Bowl, um, we set up a war room, we were participating in conversation. We also had a TV spot uh, in, in the Super Bowl. But the thing that's probably talked about the most is when the lights went out, four minutes later, we launched a tweet that said, you can still dunk in the dark. And the ability to react in real time uh, with something that was tied to a really creative message, working with our creatives in real time, transformed. So you, know, you put the lights out. So I was at the Super Bowl. <laughs> People asked me, how do you do that? I said, the first thing, you got to find the plug that you have to pull. And anyway, yeah. But, uh, Didn't you but, see everyone dunking there? <laughs> yeah, exactly. but, but it was interesting because I don't think enough organizations are built to operate at this pace at which culture is happening right now uh, and be able to participate in that content creation in real time. And that's going to just be the name of the game, I think, moving forward. Well, that pace is 
incredibly rapid. And you know, the question that I have as I'm sitting here is, how do you learn this stuff? Um, Ryan, you're a college dropout, as, as, I, as I told the audience. And, and there have been uh, quite a number of notable entrepreneurs uh, in, this, in this medium who have also dropped out of college. So I wonder um, if college, you know, we've, I've been asking about whether TV, how, how does TV maintain its relevancy? Is college still relevant in this uber, fast-paced, moving world that we're now inhabiting? I, I think that for entrepreneurs, I've sat on a lot of entrepreneurial panels, and, and one of the things that I'm always curious about is when people started their first business. Um, it's unbelievable the number of like student work painters that end up being entrepreneurs down the road later on in their career, and there seems to be a really strong correlation to starting young uh, in, in, in entrepreneurialism. Um, I don't... I, I think there's an absolute great place for, for traditional education. I think it, it has to evolve as, as we're seeing new models and new means of, of distributing content. Um, but you know, maybe for entrepreneurs, something different is, is more in order. And uh, you're right, there is a long kind of history of people just, you know, I got impatient. I was, I was like, I want to go in charge and, and, and go and do something. And, and anybody who's been to the South by Southwest tech portion would be witness to that. I mean, it is thousands and thousands of young people who are ready to put college on hold for that next opportunity. So when you say it has to evolve, how, how, how do you suggest it do so? Well, I really love what uh, Peter Thiel's doing. I think it's really interesting. He's paying people $100,000, young entrepreneurs that have a lot of promise, paying them $100,000 to drop out and, and saying, <laughs> go, and, go and charge on your idea and, and get to it. Um, Entrepreneurs figure out problems that, that get in the way, and, and you know they look at, at uh, bureaucracy and, and want to get from point A to point B as quick as possible, and bureaucracy drives them crazy, right? They try to just get rid of systems and just make it happen. Um, so I think that that is a really interesting initiative. Uh, I like that. Um, I love models that kind of look at things like that. So everybody in here is going to say, okay, what well, we deduce from this panel to drop out of college. <laughs> no. Ken, do you have any comments on, on, on the relevancy of college? Well, I have two kids who went to college, and I think the social experience in college is really important. I mean, obviously the academics are, but I think I told my kids that the social experience was equally important. So I think you miss that if you don't. I dropped out of college because I was a horrific student. But um, but I'm all for it, and I <laughs> <coughs> and they learned a lot in college about how to get along with people. I wouldn't pay somebody a hundred thousand dollars to drop out of college. I don't. I'm not a fan of that. Although these two young guys came to us about a year ago, and they were at Harvard, and they said we want to start this company, and we said, okay, we think it's terrific, but we can't do it while you're a full-time student. So you have to make a decision. And they made a decision to leave school. But um, that's just because you don't want somebody to do it you know, with one-tenth of their time. But I don't, you so don't know. How much did you give them? <laughs> <laughs> I don't more, than <laughs> more than $100,000. More than $100,000. <laughs> but it wasn't, a, it wasn't a quid pro quo, right, that way. I mean, um, I think college works for some people and doesn't work for other people. My son went to college and then didn't go to business school and built his company from the ground up. And that's, a, that's spectacular to build it from the ground up. You'll learn much more, I think, building the company from day one, brick by brick, than uh, any other way. And, and, and do you think that that's a perfectly fine message to project, that, that college is for some and, and not for others? Uh, I, you know, I only think of it as a parent. So from a parent's perspective, I think it's perfectly fine, but I wouldn't ever give anybody else's hmm. uh, child advice to drop out. It has I to be their the, decision. The economics of college have made it. You cannot go into college today at the economics with a lack of real clarity over why you're going. You know, I think it is difficult just because of, you know, I have a five and a half year old, so I think of, I project into the future what college is going to cost. And, you know, I think of my own college experience, and I agree with you on the social aspect. 
you know, I think my greatest skill set walking out of college was my mastery over John Madden football. Um, and, you know, and well, I that's only, okay. You wouldn't have done that otherwise. Yes. <laughs> and I only, um, I only um, really got into college, if we're being honest, because I wrote my own recommendation by Michael Jackson, uh, <laughs> who, by the way, I was thinking about this while I was driving over here. Um, you know, he doesn't remember, and clearly when we shook hands, and he said, um, hap I'm so glad you're here. Mike Milken came to my house when I was 14 years old with Michael Jackson for dinner. Um, and it was one of the most memorable experiences of my childhood, as you can imagine. Um, but I think college is, it's, you know, become a gamble in some ways. And to go to co college with a lack of clarity over why you're going, because now when you come out with this enormous debt, you know, and there's, you know, the job market isn't exactly, um, you know, it doesn't make it easy to pay back that debt. So. Um, you know, I, I think there's all sorts of in interesting innovations going on, but at the end of the day, college is an incredible opportunity provided that you come out of it with skill sets. Bonin, any thoughts? Yeah, you know, you asked me when we were setting up, and, and I, my answer was close to Ken in the sense that I, I believe in college. I mean, I had some of my best times of my life in college. I learned how to play James Bond, uh, Madden. But anyway, um, but... And, I, I, and the reason why is because I think that social experience is, is crucial. Um, so I, I don't recommend not to go to college, but I do think the economics make people have a totally different kind of uh, math around it. Where I'm concerned on the educational front, though, is A, we're not, early education is not driving enough kids into math and science. At the end of the day, we know that technical jobs are only going to get greater. Our vocational system is broken. So why aren't we teaching coding and programming as part of vocational training versus, you know, we have workforces that need to be completely reskilled. So you have these massive organizations with folks that don't, you know, the, uh, we were talking and people are saying, well, is mobile, is mobile real? Is mobile, are you kidding me? There are more mobile phones in the world and toothbrushes, you know, it's like, I mean, literally there's one billion more mobile phones and toothbrushes in the world. So, uh, you know, and so you have, and then you look at business schools. So, uh, um, so dentistry school. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> dentistry needs to be fixed, apparently. Mobile <laughs> dentists. Um, but uh, you look at business schools, and if you look at the descriptions of the classes for the top 100 business schools, less than 1% of those descriptions even use the term digital in it. So what are we teaching these people who are graduating to go run businesses? And I, I had a similar experience when I was at PepsiCo where a big school put together, here's marketing, here's how you're going to, a marketing class runs, one week marketing training. Not one course on digital. This was three years ago. Which is interesting That's because Bonin and I spoke on the phone and I said, Does, do, do all companies have to have a digital strategy? And he said, we don't even think about it as a digital as a digital strategy, it's just part of the strategy. So it's interesting that colleges don't even don't even teach it. Well, business school. I mean, e-commerce. One of the big CPG companies. Uh, I don't want to name, but they looked. At, they sat down with Amazon five years ago, and Amazon wasn't even a top twenty-five retailer for them. Now Amazon is the top five retailer for them. I mean, these businesses are going to be completely transformed, and we're not. Educating organizations aren't reskilling their people. Business schools aren't educating people for what the real future is, and so that's what is more concern concerning to me than college. Maybe we have a couple minutes uh, before this panel ends. If anyone has any questions, I know we talked about a lot of different things here, um, but but if you do, um, there's a microphone in the middle, but I can probably hear you and repeat your question up here in front. Did everyone hear that question? How can we use mobile technology to uh, confront abuse and, and, and issues like that? And, and I think that, that technology is certainly been being used for it. Does anyone want to comment on? Well, you that? can uh, raise an enormous amount of money for uh, charities online, and people have great success in doing that after, you know, the list is too long of tragedies. So, and a lot of not-for-profits are doing very well with their mobile strategy. So I don't really agree with your premise. I think there's as much going on in the not-for-profit world using mobile as there is in the profit world. I mean, I think technology is fundamentally agnostic. It can be driven in a lot of different ways and it's being used in, in the Middle East right now to literally ignite and transform, you know, um, 
cultures that have been under regimes for generations. And now because of these tools that we have, you know, today when you hear about what's happening on the streets of Syria, it's not because of, you know, reporters who are on the ground. It's because of um, normal people using social media to spread their message and demand change. So I, I think it's happening. I mean, sadly, there's a long list of problems in the world. Um, but I do think... Petitions, for example, and the time that it would take to get thousands of petitions signed it, it, when you use your, your, your social media, I mean, it, it, it takes hours, you know, to, to accumulate as many as it might take uh, for months. I think there's very, there's very tangible, impactful things that are happening, whether it's the use of these devices to detect different types of disease, to work on cataracts, what doctors are doing in Africa. I mean, so there's huge, or in India, you know, the one big challenge is, is, uh, is um, counterfeit pharmaceuticals. And there's a company that allows you, they print it on the back of every real pharmaceutical box, and you can text that number in, you get a text message back that tells you this is, you know, a pharmaceutical. And they're eradicating a black market of pharmaceuticals with this tiny device and a text message. So I think there are very big impactful things that are happening. Yes, sir. Standing in the future, can you each describe what your company looks like 10 years from now? Question is, can you each describe what your company looks like 10 years from now? And then we'll take one more question after the panel is answered. Uh, I, I, I don't know. <laughs> I really don't know what we look like. 10 years, I mean, again, I think the pace of change is just happening at a rate that's unprecedented. Do you even know what your company will look like one year from uh, now? <laughs> yeah, I think, you know, but I, I, do, I do know what I wish it would look like. I, I, I want it to be agile and as nimble as the startup companies that are, you know, so that's a hope and dream for me because I think that's how you move uh, and you create new value, but I have no, I, it's very difficult. Gotham? You know, I, I think the company that I'm supposedly talking about, Graphic India, I, I would like to think of it as this sort of imaginarium. And 10 years, I mean, look, we set out to create the Marvel Comics of Asia, so I hope we can accomplish that, because they had a pretty good exit. Um, but I think, um, but I think honestly, it's about giving, you know, if, if I, I mentioned Pokemon, I sort of look at like what the Japanese have been able to do in terms of mining their own indigenous culture, and it wasn't, you know, it's not Japanese kids that made Pokemon a multi-billion dollar property, it was all kids. Because they tapped into a deeper sort of subconscious. You know, my kid watches Pokemon every morning. And, and I think, you know, that type of storytelling, I think the next Steven Spielbergs, the next J.K. Rowlings are sitting in a village in India right now. And they, today we have the tools to give them that can help them sort of spread their story to the world. And that's exciting. So if I sort of, and I, I think, you know, this idea of a open source type of lab, creative lab in this case, um, I think that's really, you know, exciting and technology is moving so fast and particularly in places like India and China, um, you know, it can hardly keep up with itself. You know, they're activating, you know, I don't know, you probably know the numbers better than I do, but how many cell phones are being activated is something like 80 million cell phones a month. I mean, it's just un incredible. And so, you know, you see these quantum leaps of an innovation. They don't go through the same sort of steps we do. They just leap right over it. You're going from people who never had phones in a village to all of a sudden, sudden having 4G technology. You know. Ryan. Well, uh, considering social didn't exist 10 years ago, this is a, a you know, stretch looking ahead. But I think, um, as I mentioned, I'm, I'm really interested in creating an innovative culture where uh, we are continually pushing the envelope in terms of what our, our product is doing. I think you know, a lot of how people got into social is social media marketing. I think it just ultimately becomes part of marketing and a channel of marketing. And, and uh, ultimately, I think that as we look at the social business, that's going to be so important to think about every external facing role in an organization, support as the triage area where it all kind of starts into marketing, sales, PR, HR, IR, management, all are going to need to be involved in social. And, and so thinking about how we help them manage that and take the pain out of that is going to be a big part of what we do. We're probably not going to be able to get to a last question, but I want to give Ken a, a chance to answer the previous question, which is where do you see your company? Oh, well, our, our son is a partner in our company, so uh, that's his problem. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, thank you all so much uh, to our panel, uh, Ken, Ryan, Gotham, and Bonin. Uh, thank you all so much. Have a great rest of your day.